Hi, I'm Julia Volkman, and I'm going to give you a short talk about stress in the bilingual brain. I am a teaching fellow in the neuroscience learning course at Harvard Extension School. You should take the course, but don't be overly impressed. This is some typical Harvard students. So just so you know, at finals, to relieve their stress, they run around naked. Maybe this year it'll be on Zoom due to the pandemic. We'll see. So to do anything, we need the entire brain, including streaking. We need the entire brain. There, these are the parts of the brain we use to read English. So it's not just one part, right? First, we have to see it with the occipital lobe. Then we attach form with the temporal lobe. We find meaning with the prefrontal cortex. And we respond, speaking or thinking, adding in the parietal lobe. So we've got the whole brain involved in everything. This is like a reading committee, right? If you've ever been a, on a committee, like, you know it's very hard to get anything done, so it's pretty amazing that the brain can actually read. So in different languages, the networks for reading vary, and that depends on a couple things that we know about. First, to give you an example, you can see that if you're reading Italian or English, you are using these parts of your left hemisphere, and then here's the flipped brain, these parts of your right hemisphere. But if you're reading Italian, you're actually using more energy right here, more activity there, Versus if you're reading English, you're using more activities happening right there. In Chinese, you see similar variations, whereas in English, these areas are active for reading, and in Chinese, these areas are active, particularly this middle frontal gyrus. We'll talk about that again now, because reading networks also vary by the method of learning. So if you learn by writing, which is common for learning Chinese script, is to practice writing them, you will actually use more of your middle frontal gyrus, which is up here near externs area. Right? And you can see that if you learn English characters by writing, which some methods teach, then you also are using more of that middle frontal gyrus. So the way that you use the brain varies not only in the language, but on the method of teaching. So is there a bilingual advantage in the brain? Well, there is data that shows that bilingualism increases your white matter. Now, what is white matter? White matter is the connections that are myelinated in the brain. They're long axonal tracts, and you can see white. Here, there are long axonal tracts that have myelin, that insulated fatty sheath, on top of them to make them stronger connections. Bilingualism also increases gray matter. And gray matter is this part here where the cell bodies, the neuron soma, have lots of dendrites attached to them. And so it looks kind of gray. It doesn't look white. So it's literally based on color. So bilingualism increases both your white matter and your gray matter. That sounds pretty good, right? And they think bilingualism may also enhance executive functions. There's been a lot of studies, particularly on children, that show benefits in executive functions. And you don't have to start speaking another language at birth in order to realize these benefits. It seems like if you have some intensive instruction and then you continue a little bit after that, as these studies show, then you can actually have an executive function boost, it looks like. However, not all studies agree that your executive functions are improving with bilingualism. And there are several small and large studies that have failed to replicate those findings on executive functions. So do we know for sure? N maybe not yet. The jury's still out. But we know we increase white matter. We know we increase gray matter. And we also know that we delay the onset of Alzheimer's with bilingualism. That's a huge effect. If you already have genetic predisposition for Alzheimer's, you may start to show symptoms when you're 80. However, if you're bilingual, you may still develop those same challenges in your brain at 80, but the symptoms don't show until 85. And that's, they think, because there are so many different pathways for your brain to use, because when you become bilingual, you strengthen many other neural networks and strong hubs. So when part of the brain deteriorates, you have other parts that the brain can use as workarounds. And the brain likes to keep working. It really does. The other possible benefit is enhanced working memory. And I <laughs> show you this picture here because we're in the middle of the pandemic right now and people are working from home when they can. And even if you have little kids and they're getting into everything. So your working memory demand gets really high if you have to keep track of the person you're meeting with on your computer, the computer work you're doing to support that meeting, and then your toddler running around pulling down the cake that you had to make for your spouse for dinner because you can't go out. Anyway, a lot of working memory demand increases during stressful times and you get a boost to working memory from bilingualism. All right, so here's a quiz. Do you think people are more or less stressed in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic? Big question, right? 
more. We are all under chronic stress right now. We all are. You go to the grocery store and people are crabby, right? They got to follow these lines and wearing their masks. Okay. Typically, when you're not all stressed out, your executive functions are really in charge of what's going on with your brain. And they happen kind of in the front, in the prefrontal cortex, right? And that's this part that's shown here in the slide. Okay, and that's controlling top down. Is it a good idea to do that? Do I have time to do that? It's figuring it all out. Okay, but when we're stressed, that changes. And this activity leaves the prefrontal cortex, a lot less activity happening there. And it moves instead to these limbic structures. So you've got the amygdala, you've got the basal ganglia and the hippocampus in there, where a lot of stuff is happening that kind of prepares you to deal with difficulties. Okay, so the fight or flight response, that type of thing. So think about it this way. You just uh, make a mistake at work and your boss yells at you because he's stressed out. So he yells at you and he's like, why did you do that for? And you're like, ah! like all of a sudden you feel like physically like what's happening, right? And then your boss says, how are you going to fix it next time? And so you're like, uh, well, uh, I can, uh, and you can, something comes out of your mouth, right? But you don't know what it is. You have one thing that comes out, tunnel vision. That's the only thing you can work with. Okay, that's the stress response. The main results of a stress response are that you get high levels of neurotransmitter release. The activity moves from the prefrontal cortex to the limbic system. You get activation of the sympathetic adrenal medullary axis, which triggers the fight or flight response. You get activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, HPA axis, which leads to the release of cortisol and other substances. And that mobilizes the body's energy supply. It kind of prepares you for healing if you've been injured or to continue your, your fight uh, if you need to prolong it. And then there's an upregulation of immune system and inflammatory activity. And evolutionarily, they think this is to prepare you for healing if you've been injured. Stress impairs your thinking processes because it's prioritizing your survival responses, right? That's a very good thing for the body to be able to do to prioritize living. But it means your other fun areas may suffer. So here's what I'm talking about there. To learn, we need many systems to work together. We have the attention, we have memory, two key aspects of learning. We have our executive functions. And in the center of all of that is working memory. So these are really key things to learn acquire new knowledge and new skills. Our executive functions, let me just give you a little more detail on what we mean by that. So first of all, working memory is the ability to keep several things in mind and work with those things at the same time. So for example, your spouse gives you the shopping list and they list off 10 things that you need to bring home and you come home and you only brought four things. Okay, you weren't like a bad person, you just didn't write it down. Working memory limit is like four to five most people keep four to five things, some people up to seven. And so that's a, a limit of your working memory, which means you need to recognize that, write it down next time. Inhibitory control. This means the ability to not do an unskillful action. So for example, you want to yell at your boss, bad idea, and you don't. You inhibit the unskillful action. You want to eat the fourth cookie, and you don't because you inhibit. You know it's not a good choice. Inhibiting unskillful actions. And then there's cognitive flexibility. So this is when you can switch mindsets to see things from a different view and different set of possibilities. So for example, your spouse loads the dishwasher the wrong way. All the bowls and plates are mixed up. They're not separate. It's a problem, right? Okay, no. You have cognitive flexibility because you can see there's more than one way to load the dishwasher. It may not be as efficient, but it's fine, right? So you don't start World War III you have cognitive flexibility. Put these all together and you get higher level executive functionings like reasoning, problem solving, and planning. All right, so those are the foundational components. With stress, stress, acute stress responses, you get impaired working memory, you get impaired cognitive inhibition, right? And you get impaired cognitive flexibility. So it's like you can't keep track of what's going on, you can't inhibit unskillful actions, so you're, so you're just like, ah, you know, yelling and snapping. And then you have no cognitive flexibility. So your brain comes up with one possibility for you to act, to follow for action. And you can't think about other things. You can't consider other options. You do get an enhancement of response inhibition, which means you really can focus on that one way of doing things and only do that. So it's like you have tunnel vision to get that one um, survival strategy accomplished. 
So maybe because there might be this working memory boost, maybe st bilinguals are a little stressed out. You can we could do a survey of the group that's attending the the uh, JALT conference and find out. Chronic stress causes even more trouble than acute stress. A lot more trouble, actually. It causes greater decreases in executive functions, including working memory performance. This is just one study as an example. And it causes long-term changes that make the acute stress response more likely. So it's more likely that you actually are going to snap and jump into that acute stress response based on a kind of a smaller threshold, a lower threshold of what will tip you over the edge. Now, chronic stress also causes physical changes in the brain's memory area. So we're talking about the hippocampus here. And there's two different, well, there's three different areas, but there's two different primary areas we're focused on for this. The dorsal, which is the front part of the hippocampus, and the ventral, which is the bottom back part. In the dorsal hippocampus, you get some damage and uh, in a stress. And you can see here that healthier, you have a lot of little dendritic branches, right, healthy. And then stressed, you're losing some of those branches. So they're not getting used, so they're getting pruned away. So what this causes difficulties with are spatial memory, with learning, navigation, exploration, and kind of contextual fear. So contextual fear means being afraid of something like sticking your hand in a fire. That's an intelligent fear. So in the ventral area of the hippocampus, however, you're getting some strengthening to your nerves. And you can see here a healthy ventral hippocampus campus neuron is kind of sparse, and a stressed one is really loaded with dendritic branches. Okay, this is because that part of the brain is involved with the stress response, and it gives direct input to the amygdala. It regulates your interpretation of emotions. It influences your emotional states, affective states, um, and it motivates you to eat and drink and maybe a little hanky-pinky and to defend yourself, right? So you're kind of all these base... Uh, uh, biological motivations are elevated with that, okay? All right, so I'm not trying to depress you, right? We, we don't need to just give up and have a beach party. I'm showing the, this because there are ways that we can soothe the stress beast. And so if we look back at this same slide, we see these difficulties that are caused, um, if we just take the hippocampi as an example, we can think about what we could do to lighten the load for the dorsal hippocampus and put more emphasis on accessing the brain through the ventral hippocampus. So um, if, you're, if you're watching this and you're a teacher in the classroom, just pause it for a minute and think about what you could do based on this list and come back to us and I'll go through a few possibilities. So chronic stress is causing these physical damages um, to the dorsal area, but it's helping the ventral area work better, which means we can take advantage of that to get in and kind of get access to the rest of the brain so that the stress response doesn't go wacko, all right? So one thing that works is inspirational stories. You want to have to approach people from an emotional perspective to kind of engage them and get their attention because their attention is really caught up in whatever the stressor is. So we have to get their attention somehow. Inspirational stories can do that. Um, Context-based scenarios, so real scenarios, not like pretend, pretend you're at the supermarket, but anything real with what's happening in your learning environment where they can interact um, to help build some relationships and also use um, some new language skills that you want them to, to work on and develop. Um, low stakes quizzes are really great. You don't want anything high stakes because that can trigger your uh, stress response. But low stakes quizzes were, for example, now with all our online learning platforms, you can often allow the students to correct their own errors and take the quiz as many times as they want to achieve 100. This is a wonderful learning tool and it makes a safe environment for the student to make mistakes and then they can keep doing it until they get the score that they're satisfied with. And as they keep doing it, they find their errors and correct them themselves, which is really wonderful for learning. Also, since everybody wants to eat, is everybody else gaining their COVID-19? So everybody wants to eat. So you can just do some cultural cooking in the language that you're targeting, right? Cooking, excellent thing to do. It's things you might not want to do because they focus heavily on dorsal hippocampus um, strengths would be like scavenger hunts. That's like exploration and, and spatial memory and navigation, it's not really working at its best in this moment. Lists, memorizing lists, again, really tricky to do at this moment. Things in context are much more accessible for the brain. High stakes tests, definitely a bad idea in this environment. It's a little too much. The stress level gets a little wacko. 
All right, so here are some other stress reduction possibilities, and there's a lot you can go into on each of these. I do want to talk about this first point, predictable structure, procedural tasks, and doing one thing at a time, no multitasking. So a lot of us have been working with um, homeschooling remotely unexpectedly during the pandemic, and so teachers have been just kind, kind of doing their best to figure out how to get work out to the student if they've never been online before. One thing that you might notice was successful if you tried it was to have a really consistent structure, like a template, like every week we're doing this. This is your assignment every week. You do part A, you do part B, you do part C. And then what you have in those assignments, you can vary, you can have different interest levels, you can let motivation guide how they respond to the different areas, but you want to be consistent in your presentation so that the stressed out student knows what to expect. That reliable structure and procedure really helps bring things down and make the, the body feel safe in a very uh, untenable environment. So also doing one thing at a time. There's actually no such thing as multitasking in the brain. The brain likes to go procedurally, sequentially. Simultaneous stuff is really uncommon in the brain. So you should also be doing one thing at a time and asking one thing at a time from them. Another quick tip is buffer time. You can allow some inhibitory control to kick in if you just wait. So if I say, uh, David, I really want to hear your thoughts on the uh, menu that we cooked last week and what were your findings. So do you see that I said David first? I want to get David's attention and repeat the question a couple times, give him lots of time to orient to the fact that he's being asked to respond and to formulate an answer in case he wasn't quite on track. You don't want him to fail publicly. So give him time to orient and to prepare a response. And you can do that by kind of being a little repetitive in your question that you ask. Very simple thing. Um, distraction from stress in your assignments, you might want to do fun things that are in your target language, like reading a common strip, comic strip in the target language. You're probably already doing these things. Learning one phrase by watching you know, their favorite show in the target language. I, I love Star Trek. Um, things like that to ease the stress while also focusing on your learning goals. Positive relationships, you know, being very supportive, offering compassion first. Always err on the side of compassion first, especially in this stressed out moment. And inspiration, stories about how people are, are, are doing things in this environment you know, to learn or something beautiful about the culture you're targeting that's happening now. And you can find those, you know, like some good news or something like that on YouTube. Okay. Um, Self-regulation and empowerment. It's while you want these predictable structures, you also want to have flexibility so that students can figure out what's going to work for them. So you may want to have within each structure, we do A, B, and C, they can have choice. Are they going to write about this topic, this topic, this topic, right? Are they going to research this, this, or this? And they can have flexibility within your common structure so that their interests can help drive what they're learning. That empowers them to feel like they can be successful. Some things we can't really control in the remote learning or, or classroom environment is exercise. Um, a little bit you can. Sleep, um, mindfulness-based stress reduction or yoga, although you can take mindful minute to start class and bring everybody in to class with you or having time in nature, views of outdoor landscapes. When we're all together again in the physical environment, taking your class outdoors in good weather can be very soothing. And uh, just doing your same procedure, but outdoors. And then for yourself, think about if you're really able to implement these strategies for sleep. Exercise will really help improve your sleep um, and any mindfulness strategies that you can have in time outdoors. All right, so my point is, we cannot think about learning without thinking about the biology of the entire body, right? Thank you for listening. I hope you found this useful and I will see you later.